Hello, and welcome to episode number 378 of the Armin Show podcast, Science, People, Creativity, Learning More. We're always expanding our knowledge. Lifelong learning is important. Subscribe if you haven't, YouTube, Spotify, wherever it may be. On this episode here, we have a wonderful guest, the author of this fine book, Visual Thinking, Dr. Temple Grandin. Welcome to the show. It's great to be here. I'm very glad to have you on. I like the cover of your book. It's very noticeable if I saw it in a bookstore. I would go towards it because it's got shapes, colors, and it's very clear. And I somewhat think in this way as well. And you describe it along the way in the book, which is wonderful. Now, before uh, we get into our talk, I would like to describe your background. You're an American scientist, academic, and animal behaviorist. You're a prominent proponent for the humane treatment of livestock for slaughter and the author of more than 60 scientific papers on animal behavior and a clear visual thinker. How long have you known you were a visual thinker? When was the earliest moment you noticed this? Well, uh, when I was in my 20s and I first started my work on uh, cattle behavior, I did not know that other types of thinking existed. I thought everybody thought in pictures the way I did. And being a visual thinker helped me with my work because the first thing I did was to go, why are the cattle easily going through this chute to get vaccinated? And in another place, they're stopping. And it would be something like a coat on a fence, a shadow. And nobody had looked at that before. But I didn't know other people thought verbally. Because if you think verbally, you wouldn't look at it. Because even now, I find that um, when I point it out to people, they see it. A shadow, for example. But often they don't see it until I point it out. And in my late 30s, I was kind of getting an inkling that maybe other people thought differently than I did. And my thinking is bottom up. My concepts of different things are sort of like putting specific examples into columns on a spreadsheet, bottom up thinking. So I've now learned that that's similar to artificial intelligence. And verbal thinker is top down. And if you ask me something like your pet or you, or their house or their car, most people can kind of visualize that, see a picture. But you ask somebody about something that's out there in the environment, but they often don't pay any attention to it, such as church steeples. I see specific ones, and they come up like PowerPoint slides. I was shocked when I asked the speech therapist, access your memory on church steeples, and all she got was this vague, pointy, thing. There was nothing specific. It was like a vague representation of a steeple. That was a shock. And then I kind of started, um, you know, finding out more and I kind of figured out that there's a visual thinker like me who thinks in photorealistic pictures. There's a more of a pattern thinker. And then there's a verbal thinker. And then when I did my book, I got deep into the research and found this research that shows very clearly you can have object visualizers like me. And then you can have pattern mathematical visualizers. They think in patterns, not photorealistic pictures. And then, of course, there's people that are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. It's quite interesting. I often think about what kind of thinker a person is. I've thought about this for many years. I think of it also in terms of linear versus nonlinear as well, which you mentioned in the book. I am definitely nonlinear. It's associative. And verbal thinking is much more linear. Now, I think in an associative way, but there's a logic to the associations. You might want to give me a key word, pretend that I'm a, like a Google for images, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you how I bring up the pictures, similar to what was shown in the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, showing all the pictures of shoes. But then I can get off the subject. So think of a really creative keyword, and I will... Um, tell you exactly how I think in an associative manner. Luminescence. Luminescence. Well, I'm actually seeing some lighting in a chicken house right now because previously I was looking up articles on on chicken houses right before. And so now I'm in the LED light um, file, like in my brain, and I'm seeing different LED lights. I remember taking one apart one time, and it was just like a little electronic flat thing. Um, see, then I can think of, now I'm thinking of other places that might be LED lights. And one of the problems in autism is some people can see them flicker. So now I've gotten from illumination 
in a chicken house, which I read about this morning, to problems with LED lights for a certain segment of the autistic population. But you well, see, there is a kind of logic to that. Right. And the chicken house came up first because I looked at that 15 minutes ago before I got it on the podcast with you. It's quite interesting. I want to try one more because it just came to my mind. Gothic architecture, what comes to mind for me? Oh, I'm seeing, you know, the great cathedrals. Um, you know, the beautiful craftsmanship of that. That's the first thing that comes up. Uh, now I'm seeing that Adam's Family TV show. And uh, now it's a really goofy show. <laughs> but you see how it's kind of related. That's true. There's something nice about the visualization. And also it made me think of the how it would relate to the skill of, for like, uh, I remember a long time ago, I'm not it, but for dentists, that they have the dental exam test and they have a spatial awareness part of it, that, that this would be a high level uh, skill to have for that part to visualize like a tooth and how you work on the tooth. Is but there's, you see, but there's an abstract visual spatial and then there's photo realistic. Now this gets back to my work with um, large, meatpacking plant construction. And I discovered something very interesting there. When I was writing the book, Visual Thinking, I went back through every project where I spent a lot of time on the job site. And I'm gonna guess about 20% of the welders that invented things and patented them, but maybe had not graduated from high school, um, they would do the clever equipment. And then there were people labeled drafting technician, they were laying out entire factories. And so there's like two parts of the engineering. There's the mathematical degreed engineer who figures out all the refrigeration and boilers. My kind of mind doesn't touch that stuff. We don't understand that. It's too mathematical. Make sure the roof doesn't fall down. But then all the clever equipment. Think mechanical, clever equipment. Okay, uh, think paper feed mechanism in your printer. That's the kind of thing that the non-degreed engineer figures out how to design. And I saw that division of labor in every single plant. And what's happening now, since we've taken shop classes out of the schools, um, if you want a poultry processing plant right now, you have to import all the equipment from Holland. And there's a link here with our educational system. I'm very concerned about skill loss. Very, very concerned. Um, because the people in the shop invent all the clever engineering where it's mechanically clever equipment. It's a different kind of thinking. Now, the other thing is my kind of mind can't do algebra. And some people think you need algebra for logical thinking. I don't need algebra for logical thinking. And I was just reading an article in Science just this morning on a game called Strategio, which is sort of chess mixed together with poker. And it's all pattern thinking. I'm looking, I'd be really terrible at this game. I was terrible at chess. You see, they, the visual thinking that I have is a different type of thinking. We're the ones that are going to make sure that maybe the power grid doesn't fall apart. You're going to need us for that. And, and we're being screened out. Because what's happening is the little shops are not forming anymore. The kids are playing in video games in the basement instead of, you know, making stuff. No, there's a big problem. And... You see, if you look at something like the Mars rover, and that China also has one too, and you look at all the selfies that they take of themselves, they have beautiful hand-done wiring. The camera has hand-done wiring. So the mathematicians get it to Mars, but there's people in the shop building that stuff. And that often doesn't get enough credit. And I've seen situations, this really makes me angry, where a person in the shop invented a piece of equipment and the degreed engineer was first author on the patent. That's not right. I won't go into the details. Some of the people are still alive. Right. No, it's a valid point. It's a very key part. It makes, makes me think of if there is a shortage of shop classes and those types of hands-on, uh, putting things together type of class, then if an individual like you was to go through school, would you recognize that the thing I'm good at is not here to work on? Or would you feel like 
I'm just not good at the things that well, are available. What I have found is students get interested in stuff they get exposed to. And I'm seeing kids today growing up never used a tape measure, not using tools. How can you find out you like them or you're good at them if you're not exposed? And and I think it's a very big problem. And what I'm realizing, it's a different kind of thought because I've had some educators tell me that you have to have algebra to think logically. It's not how I think. And then there's a lot of people that are kind of mixtures. And uh, there's a lot of people like me that kind of go in the back door where um, you start out maybe getting a job on the line, gravitate to the maintenance department. 15 years later, you're involved in a new plant addition. I've seen that. Just going in the back door and then working your way up. But I'm concerned about... today that um, we don't have people to fix stuff, important stuff. And the other thing is some of these kids that are get addicted to video games, when they discover auto mechanics, they find it's more interesting than video games. And they give up the video games because the motors and all the mechanical things are much more interesting. And there's then also on animal thinking, and there's a chapter in my book, the visual thinking on animals, is that if you're a total verbal thinker, you might have a hard time imagining how a dog can think. But I always thought it was ridiculous to say that a dog's not conscious because I don't think in words. When we see the similarity, we can understand. Now, what kind of thinker do you think you are? So the, the way I have described myself prior to your content was I always thought of myself as nonlinear, um, very like a network of thoughts similar to what you were describing but not as much picture oriented. I've always described myself as not nonlinear, but I've always liked text word search puzzles. So it is text, but less visual than you are, I think. It was tough, I was reading the book and I was wondering about that a bit. Well, a lot of the people I've worked with, I mean, they just see in their head how to make a machine. They just see how it, works and there's nothing abstract about it right and the skill loss thing is serious we do not make the state-of-the-art electronic chip making machine it comes from holland and that goes back to what's um see in, in holland and italy where a lot of equipment's coming mechanical equipment comes from at ninth grade you can go university route or you can go the tech route we tend to stick our nose up at the tech route and go, well, you, the stupid kids used to take shop. I can tell you, I worked on these big complicated projects and they're not the stupid kids. It's a different kind of problem solving. And the first step I tell big corporations is you have to know, realize these different kinds of thinking exist and they're good at different things. We don't recognize the, the value that people bring. It's such a loss. I've, I've mentioned that a few times. Each person's main category of ability, if that is left out, it's almost like you're negating a large portion of that person in perpetuity. That's not good. Well, I'm, I'm telling corporations, you need it. Like uh, I'm saying you need, you know, and the other thing I'm noticing, let's look at people that repair things like elevators and escalators. Uh, you just look at that. Uh, teachers actually relate to this one. I said, I went to a major airport within the last couple of months and there were four guys, an escalator completely ripped apart. I'll tell you right now, and you rip them apart, the conveyor inside looks just like meatpacking plant stuff. The big chain that pulls the escalator around. And three out of four were gray. I had an airline mechanic come on my plane about a month ago, sat in the captain's chair, and I'm going, mm -mm, we're going to get a canceled flight. And he was gray. I, they're, not, the, the, they're not getting replaced the way they should. Because the kind of people that like to do those kind of jobs, they're the kids that did well in shop class. And I've been on some rather questionable elevators in the last six months. Missing a floor, a jerky operation scraping in the shaft, the door operation jerky hadn't been serviced. You know, a very key point you bring up is something I recently read about and how in the next let's say in the United States, in the next 10, 20 years, we will have a shortage of the individuals doing what you're describing, as well as in some of the trades, uh, the younger workforce that is malleable and can put things together will become more valuable because there's 
less of them for the reasons you described, plus um, the you know very old population will be not doing some of the things they're doing. So they'll become super valuable, even more so than 15 years ago. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, and the thing is, we have a big shortage right now of people in the high-end skilled trades. And also, because that, you know, the people I worked with, you had people that, you know, maybe a high school graduate, 20 patents, the mechanical devices selling the stuff all around the world, and 20% of them are probably autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And I have to be vague about the stuff they make because uh, they're not formally diagnosed. But I can tell you, I know what autistic or dyslexic person why after I talk to them. That's pretty cool. One thing I want to go back to actually, earlier you mentioned artificial intelligence and how your thinking is like artificial intelligence. It's becoming way more in the news lately. Like there's this uh, chat, um, chat GPT that people are responding to with artificial intelligence. How is your mind similar to that? And what do you think as far as artificial intelligence? Well, it tends to be bottom-up thinking. And when I first realized this, and this is a little few years ago now, I read about training an artificial intelligence program to diagnose melanoma, a skin cancer, with a dark, irregular outline. And I think they showed it something like 2,000 pictures of melanoma, and then they showed it a whole bunch of pictures of like ugly age spots, which I've got, unfortunately, mosquito bites and all you know, other rashes. And, and it learns to categorize melanoma from non-melanoma. And it gets feedback from experts on how good a job it's doing. That's the simplest kind of AI program. And when I read that, and it was on the cover of either Science or Nature, I subscribed to both of those, I'm going, hmm, that's exactly how I think. Because I tend to put, when I started my work on cattle handling, I went to every feed yard in Arizona, and I actually worked cattle. And I started to see patterns of what design features worked well, what design features worked badly. And I kind of put it on a spreadsheet, totally bottom up. Now to make bottom up thinking work, you have to have put a lot of data in. And it's sort of like you got to fill the database up with, with images and things. Because if I'm going to imagine how to build something, I've got to know, let's say, for example, what gates look like. You know, what different types of concrete work look like. So the older I get and the more things I experience, I actually get better at my thinking. That's bottom-up thinking. I'm 100% in that category. I've always been a bottom-up thinker and a bottom-up builder. You have to have all the pieces, and that takes time to build. So it's, a, I guess, a longer build, we can say. But once you have the build, you have way more ability than another individual that is not of that way. They can do things more quickly from the get-go, but uh, they cannot go as far from my view. Well, there was an interesting study done looking at uh, art students, science students, and humanities students, kind of like the uh, visual thinkers, the mathematicians, and the word thinkers on design a planet project. It's teams of high school students. And the, this study is uh, outlined in my visual thinking book. And they the thing that shocked me the most was not wasn't so much the different ways they went about designing the planet because my kind of thinker one group made skyscraper planet another one made a crystal planet really visually beautiful polar bears and stuff like that was on another one the scientists just kind of made a round planet you know described the atmosphere the verbal thinkers started using words and then they thought that was against the rules so they used splotches but the thing that shocked me about the verbal thinkers is they did not do any planning See, this was teams of students. And the art students and the science students did planning sessions. But you see, they oftentimes there's big verbal concepts, and they have absolutely no idea how they're going to implement it. You know, people ask me, how was I, you know, I've been, I think, fairly effective in improving how animals are handled. But working on cattle handling, that's not the whole world. That's something relatively targeted. It isn't a vague, well, we got to treat animals nicer. That's so vague, where, where do you start? And and this overgeneralization. And I've you know, and I've had, I, I've worked with verbal thinkers that are interested in in things uh, where they want to make changes and said, get something more targeted that you actually can work on. Okay, for sustainability. Let's work on supermarket food waste in your own neighborhood. But then the other thing you need to do is write about how you did it. 
you know, you can't, you're sending this stuff into, into uh, food kitchens. You've got to make sure nobody gets sick off, especially with the meat. So explain how you do it and write about how did you do it in this specific situation. You see, I tend to have too much detail. The verbal thinkers overgeneralize. But what shocked me on that study is the humanities students didn't do any planning on their planet. I like this and relate quite a bit. I'm also in the level of sometimes too much detail or understanding something too well. It's kind of like what you described for noticing things so much in a room or wherever you go. I do that uh, with certain qualities of people more so. I'm more people oriented than actual uh, mechanical, I would say. Oh no, I'm very oriented and mechanical. Like there's one pixel off on an electronic billboard, I see. I, and then I found that other people don't. I remember one time walking into the airport and the United Airlines, they had these electronic signs all along the, along the, with individual computer monitors and one monitor was scrambled. I saw that the minute I walked in and I said to the person beside me, did you see that sign was messed up? Nope, they didn't see it. Now, am I going in there specifically looking for that? No, I'm not. But I, but it's something sort of like it shouldn't be there. And that's the same way the cattle act, if there's a shadow or there's a, a piece of string hanging down, some little thing, they'll just stop at that. It's what we notice. I used to describe this in terms of category of people, such as like a person who, obviously this is not their mindset, but like let's say a real estate agent will notice architecture on houses, whereas a historical person would look at... Well, yeah, uh, and I would do the same thing. I tend to notice how things are built. I'm like, oh man, the concrete's look really heavy on this project, or, or this house is flimsy like a piece of cardboard. Now, now I'm thinking of when they, when I first moved to where I live now, uh, it was all fields around me, and they started building houses. Well, after the workers gone home, I like wander around inside the half-built houses, and I was just sort of horrified at, oh, the flimsy construction. I mean, it was like cardboard. <laughs> now yeah. the houses, that was that was uh, probably 25 years ago. I, you know, and the houses are still here, but it's very flimsy construction compared to a house that I lived in as a child that was 40 years old when we bought it. It's not always the timing. Sometimes, yeah, quality can be at any time and last longer than. Oh yeah, and then they were building. Now I'm seeing the shopping center. They built and they put the, the footers about that far into the ground. A uh, little one floor shopping center. It's not going to fall down, but they better not have any automatic doors because I don't think they're going to work very well. Is that building's not going to stay square? And they do not have any automatic doors in the little shopping center. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that just kind of pops into my mind. Those are key details, and once again, they're in the longer term category. It's almost like, yeah, the the verbal thinker, without the planning and kind of saying things without the base is shorter term in a way, I would say. And then, this kind of thinking is at the beginning. Okay, it works for the shopping center, but maybe thirty years down the line, we have more issues. Bottom up takes care of longer term. Well, you issues. see, you need both. On um, because what happened? What I've noticed happened with the steel shops I worked with. One of them that built a bunch of my specialized equipment, um, the, there was a couple, and the wife ran the business part of it. Somebody's got to order the materials, you know, the payroll, uh, pay the rent, you know, I'll just pay the property taxes, just all the, you know, the office work. And and then a lot of tech startups, they finally go, we finally have to hire a suit. And that's a, you know, so we. I, when I was out working in construction, we used to complain about how dumb the suits were. See, at the time that I was doing that, uh, 20 years ago, I didn't realize that, um, that the people we were calling suits actually think differently. So the, because we need some of the linear thinking for organizations since an organization gets big. So I tell corporations, the first thing you've got to do is realize different kinds of thinking exist, and they're good at doing different kinds of things, like let's say on tech. Okay, this Riverside um, website is real easy to use. Okay, that's something that the visual thinker like me will make, but then the mathematicians have to program it and make it work. 
it it's because the um, the math kind of thing is want to put too many features on it. And in my book, Visual Thinking, I wrote about the two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. And Wozniak, the um, computer geek, won five expansion slots on that computer, and Steve's going, the other Steve's going, no, 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 make it simple. Because the average consumer doesn't want, not going to understand five expansion slots. And you get too many features, and it gets too complicated for most people to use. On that one, I, I noticed that when I was in there. I like how it's the two Steves. They're both Steve, But Wozniak is more uh, more similar to him. And I would think about, like, oh, five expansion slots. That'd be great. Well, you think, and, and the average consumer, I just want the printer to work. Um, one of the reasons why, why Zoom took over is that I didn't have to learn how to use it. You know, when the pandemic came along and we had to get all our classes online. And I'm... Um, also, you know, other platforms like WebEx, in fact, the guy that made Zoom used to work for WebEx. WebEx wouldn't pay any attention to him, so he started Zoom. But that they, you know, make things easy to use. You know, I've got so many electronic features on a new car that I got that I, I can't, see, I don't remember sequence. You see, I have problems with remembering sequence. So complicated tech devices, I'm just not interested. Like, I don't care about 20 different settings on a microwave. I could care less. Let's just have a defrost, and, and I have an ancient microwave that people laugh at, but it still works. And I can either put it on heat or defrost, and I just turn a little knob, and I don't, you don't need all those features. Because when I think about it, the microwave can only, you know, the microwave generator only has, like, two settings, defrost and cook. And then time's the only other variable it would have. So why do you need all those fancy controls? You know, you don't need a blender that's got 20 different settings. I just find that stuff complicated to use and I hate it. Question on that one. Is it, is there something to the idea that we like simplicity in the areas that are not really our area of priority in thinking and then we like complexity where our great abilities are is there something well i think some of it is what i've read about some of the more mathematical thinkers that do programming and stuff they really deep down love the technology and and the technology just the way they do the programming the beautiful code and everything is just so cool and i can kind of think of that with mechanical devices but I also love something that's really, really simple. I always would say, think simple. Do it with two air cylinders instead of six air cylinders. You know, for example, think simple. What's the simplest way to do it? Because you're out in a factory, you got to maintain all that stuff. And that is where there's a problem because I'm dealing with mechanical devices. The more stuff you have on it, there's more stuff to break. And one of the chapters of think, visual thinking is on um, preventing disasters. And mathematicians calculate risk. I can see risk. And I use the example of Fukushima. And I was horrified when I found out why it flooded and it got, um, uh, you know, the emergency cooling pump got drowned. And Simple watertight doors would have saved it. The mathematicians did a great job of making earthquake proof. It shook. It was fine. 20 minutes later, it drowned. And I don't know how to design a nuclear reactor. But all I know is that that electric pump doesn't run when I need it. I'm in so much trouble, it's not funny. And it's not going to run underwater. Protect the pump. And... You see, I see it. I can see the water coming over the seawall. I know exactly what it's going to do. It's going to back puddle against the seawall. Now you got like you know, three feet of water over the basement door. That's the kind of stuff that I can, um, I just see it. I see risk. I also wrote about the Boeing Max. And I'm, when that started, I'm going, well, how could they have made this mistake trusty one little fragile sensor that's about the size of this pen um, they have fixed the max I've been on it five or six times now one thing it does have it has a very good coffee maker and I've been on it five or six times now it's fixed 
But the initial mistake, I'm going, how could you do this? You wired this delicate little sensor into a computer the pilots didn't know about. And nobody asked, what happens if I just snap this off? Pigeon can take that off a plane. The default setting was stall instead of fly normally. It should have been fly, if you break the sensor, fly normally and and with a light to return to the airport. You know, you return to the nearest base. Uh, but you see, I just see that because I remember when I found out what an angle of attack sensor was. And I saw how fragile they were. And then I, next time I went to the airport, I'm looking at them on the planes. I'm going, you wired one of those, no backup, to a computer the pilots were not fully informed about? You've got to be kidding. In, that, in fact, in that I predicted yeah. that when when the first accident happened, I was we were out uh, doing an autism talk uh, with a guy named Brad who tells you know that runs my book table for me. He's an aviation geek, and we like to talk about this stuff. And when that happened, all I knew was the plane was brand new, only a few months old. I didn't even know what brand of plane it was at that point. It was a brand new plane, and when you looked at the flight radar, which I had looked at. A, it, it was going like the, a roller coaster. And I'm going, what's this doing that on takeoff? So that the uh, next night I gave a talk at an autism talk and I say, Boeing's going to be in deep poo poo over this one. And he said, well, how did you know that? And when that's the only information that you had. Well, what would explain that radar tracing? No pilot in his right mind would do that. No, there had to be something drastically wrong with the plane. I had no idea what at that point. But I figured something had to be drastically wrong with the plane. But you see, I'm just seeing it. You see, it's another way of problem solving. And you need to have both. But the thing on calculating the risk, I went up and looked the tsunami data up. And there was historical data that showed that a 10-meter seawall would have been breached by tsunamis. It took me only about 20 minutes to look it up. You see, this is where you need the different kinds of problem solving. But what worries me, and educators right now, we're just going crazy on all the algebra requirements. And when I was doing book signing for visual thinking, um, they had it in a school and I talked to the principal and he didn't even know that visual thinking like my kind of thinking existed. This is this October. This is you know, a month ago. Didn't know that the way I think even existed. That is recent. <laughs> no, I right. think that's kind of scary because we have infrastructure falling apart right now and water systems and things like that. And you're going to need people like me to keep this stuff running. Very true. That's the thing. You see, you need the world really does need all the different kinds of minds. And the first step is realizing they exist. And lots of people are mixtures. Lots and lots of people are mixtures. But you get a kid with a label, then you might be an extreme object visualizer or an extreme mathematician. But you won't have a math genius and a total object visualizer in the same person because they're actually opposite traits. Mm -hmm. One thing that comes to mind in this category is. What would each of these types of thinkers look like at age 15? Are there any features you could notice quickly? Well, let's, or check let's, them on? let's go back. Let's, first of all, my, my kind of thing has got to be exposed to lots of hands on things. Okay, let's say back, I mean, I'm old now, but when I grew up, I had shop class, art, sewing. I loved all those classes. Um, and the person that would be my kind of thinker, if they had access to like grow up working on cars and that kind of stuff, they'll be really good at that stuff. The math kid's going to be good at computer programming. Um, I took a computer programming class in college. In fact, I had access to the exact same computer that, that uh, Bill Gates had access to, exact same one. And I had to drop the class and he could do it. But I was exposed. I also was exposed to playing musical instruments. Not very good at that. You know, you need to expose kids to lots of different things. And then you can see where they might gravitate 
reports. And when a kid has a label, they tend to be an extreme or one extreme or the other, where most people are kind of more mixtures. But today you've got kids growing up totally removed from the practical world. And I think that's a problem because then when you read another place uh, they used as a green room during the book tour of visual thinking was an office of a political science professor. I was in there for about an hour by myself and I started pulling the books out of our bookcase and I thought it was abstract gobbledygook about politics. It wasn't right or left. It was just abstract stuff so abstract. I said, I don't understand this. Ooh, and you're going to be making policy? I couldn't believe some of that stuff. And, and there's a tendency for verbal policymakers to make very abstract policy. I was just reading an article in Science this morning about biodiversity in Madagascar, and they use very abstract language. Well, the, you know, the humid, um, like rainforest part, is the, probably the most important part to protect. I, my approach would be, okay, how can I work on protecting that? And you've got to give the people that live there uh, a stake in this, where maybe they can make money on tourism or something to protect some of that. So I might work on, on their rainforest tourism. You see, that's something specific. Because I want to motivate the local people and make them part of the solution. But you see, that's much more targeted rather than just kind of vague statements. And it doesn't solve every problem with losing uh, biodiversity in Madagascar. But I'm going to pick out something a lot more targeted that I actually can do. And then write about how I did it. Because I used to just write how-to articles on cattle handling. How to build corral systems. Put, publish the drawings and the in the industry magazines. Put the stuff out there. How to articles and posts have always done very well. I've noticed since the beginning of, I remember in blogging maybe about 10 years ago, if you wrote a top something like top five ways or a how to article, that was the best way to go to get your material out there and seen by a lot of people because that's what people most were interested in. Well, I have a website that's got all the drawings and stuff on it. I have books on livestock handling. Uh, well, this is one of them right here, Humane Livestock Handling. And it's got all the drawings in there, you know, for my big systems. Then I have another book on Guide to Working with Farm Animals that's aimed at smaller uh, farmers. You know, so I've got published books out there, but I also have lots of free stuff too. And people would say to me, why do you give so much stuff away? Well, there's always plenty of consulting and plenty of people tend to hold on to it too much. If you want to make change, give it away on how to, how to fix it, how to do it. That's a great point, actually. Give it away. Uh, you want to make change, change and, and explain it just in a simple, easy to understand manner. Oh, I have a point here. So. There's one, so in the 90s, we had, uh, me and my brother were early on having a computer way early on. And then later on, I realized we were in the first, let's say 0.1% of people on the planet yeah. that had a computer. But at that time we thought maybe a lot of people had a computer, I did. And we would build them and put it together. And I still remember it to this day. This is like 25 something, 30 years later. Yeah. That uh, putting it together, okay, video card issue, restarting, those kinds of things and how cool it was. And then the majority of people came into computing, not even five years later, 10 years later, 15, but in the last, in the last 10 years, when let's say Apple or certain companies have made it much simpler, like it just works. That's the thing, they made it simple. You know, why did the iPhone take over what? Because Steve Jobs was an artist. He wasn't a programmer. He made the interface easy to use. And then everybody else copied it, of course. And then the programmers had to make it work. But Steve Jobs was very influenced by a calligraphy class that he that he was in. Um, but you see, that's the art side. The interface is the my kind of thinker side. And he made a phone you didn't have to learn how to use. You know, so many other things just so complicated. Um, 
you know, I thought, well, okay, on my car, I've got the settings set. I don't even change. I don't ever change anything. One of my problems is I cannot remember sequence. I'm very bad at remembering linear sequence. So how to understand how a meatpacking plant worked. Well, when I first went in a big meatpacking plant, it was back in 1974, I looked at this and I'm going, this is so complicated. How does the plant manager understand the whole plane? Well, I've since learned that sometimes a plant manager doesn't understand the whole thing. But I would go over there, kind of made my own self-made internship every Tuesday afternoon, and I just would watch. And I'd pick up a detail. One of the first details was a very clever little cart for hauling a 55-gallon barrel uh, that attracted my attention. And then, as I, then more and more pictures went in my head. And after about two, three months of uh, Tuesday afternoons, the whole, everything was videotaped into my head and I could walk through the plant. But that didn't happen instantly. It starts out sort of bits and pieces. You know, why, why would a barrel cart, it just was so clever how it was made. It had a metal hoop that went over the barrel. It was so simple and clever and it worked really well. And that was the first thing I looked at. Um, but it takes time to download all that stuff into my head. I like that you mentioned that because I have always been on that page of it takes time, build it up. Because if you have a networking mind, you want to get all the pieces together and then your networking mind can put it together, understand it. Okay, these are all connected this way. But if you don't have all the pieces together, you can't start doing what you are skilled at, which is connecting them and making understanding. But the thing is, there's kind of two ways of problem solving because, um, you know, we still have the engineers for the building and the boilers and refrigeration. But what we're not making is mechanically clever equipment. Where it's mechanically very, very clever. And that's all coming out of Italy, Holland. Italy even has an art track in their educational system. And that's why they're making these things. Now, I can tell you right now, getting spare parts for the supply chain problems, that's a nightmare. Getting spare parts for some of this equipment. And it's very, very nice equipment. It's beautiful equipment. As far as the different kinds of thinkers, how would you describe the percentages of each one? Is there any way to break down what percentages? Well, each? that's never been really looked at. Uh, most people are mixtures. And then one tends to kind of predominate. Like when I worked on the visual thinking book, uh, my co-writer, Betsy Lerner, is a total verbal thinker. And, and I would write the rough drafts, and then she would like smooth them out and work on the organization. And then she also added some things to it. Uh, and then I also realized, you know, how different Betsy thinks. Now that I learned something from Betsy that really concerns me about infrastructure and things like this, that in order for Betsy to understand a concept like leverage, she had to relate it back to something she actually did, like prying the lid off a paint can. Now, I, we, I remember sitting on this computer and looking at um, little third grade science websites, and she'd be on the same little science website, and there was pictures of different examples of leverage. She didn't get it. And I said, hey, Betsy, you ever just pried the lid off a paint can with a screwdriver? And I said, now think about it. The blade of the screwdriver moves about a quarter of an inch, but the handle moves about three inches. That's leverage. Then she understood it. But I had to relate it back to something she actually had done. So if you've got verbal thinkers uh, growing up never doing hands-on things, and they got to make policy about stuff like power and um, water systems and things like this, it all will become way too abstract, like those political science books, very academic political science books. And then another interesting thing happened on the book tour is this is hotel in Evanston, Illinois, where in the rooms they have old textbooks from the 30s. Like some students' textbooks from the 30s were in my room. So I pull out a 1930s electrical engineering book. And it was much more applied. Yes, it had math in it. But it would explain, well, here's this generator. Here's the math that goes with this generator. Much more applied. Much more straightforward. 
and then I pull out the book on Western literature, Shakespeare, you know, um, Homer, you know, all the stuff you'd read in a, you know, in, introduction to literature class. But the preface, instead of being this academic gobbledygook, it said stuff like, there's been a lot of nonsense written about the Greeks. That was the first line of the preface. You see, a much more kind of straightforward approach. So those were some of the interesting places that stayed on the book tour in terms of books. And I was thinking about them from the different kinds of minds. You see, and some of the engineering now has got less applied. And then I hadn't really think about who, about the uh, skill loss on equipment from Holland until I, right before COVID, I went to poultry plant, two pork plants, stuff was all imported, and the Steve Jobs Theater. And the structural glass walls came from Italy and Germany. And I stood in the middle of it screaming, we don't make it anymore. And that was the sort of the impetus for doing the, the visual thinking book. And we were maybe two months into COVID. And I called up Betsy. I said, let's do a book. She had nothing to do. I had nothing to do. And we worked on the book. And now there's been another beautiful brand new poultry plant built in Canada. The equipment's all from Holland. And that opened just very recently. There's something to be said here for the strength of applied material. I, I would think to myself that in the next five to 10 years, being more direct, I would add in the word tough and also applied has much more value. It'll make you stand out very quickly. But the thing uh, is you compared. need both kinds of thinking because let's take, I went, I always think in specific examples. I went and visited a dairy up in Quebec, beautiful, a couple of really nice dairies. Small dairies, and they were using uh, robotic milkers, where the cow can decide when to go in and get herself milked. And two of the dairies had modified the gates and stuff on this system, and the company ended up um, using their modifications. But they modified the mechanical parts, mechanical parts. And one of the dairy producers said, I stop at the computer stuff. I don't touch the computer parts. He was working with the mechanical parts of the robot. You see, that's where you need both kinds of mind. He said, I stop at the computer stuff. I don't touch that. But he made modifications of the mechanical parts that the company actually adopted. What would be your suggestion? Let's say there were two kinds of people and they had different thinking. Should this individual work to improve their category of thinking as best they can? Or should they look to implement parts of the other kind of thinking that's not their natural form? Well, you've got lots of people that are mixtures, but you get that extreme super coder. He's not going to think in pictures. You get the extreme picture thinker. That they will have failed algebra. Maybe not graduated from high school. A better thing to do is you. it'd be like the iPhone. Steve Jobs made the interface. The engineers had to make it work. Okay, they let's take all the robotic stuff that's being done now. Somebody has to invent the tool that goes on the end of the arm. I have to use examples from my industry because I'm most familiar with it. Sometimes the tool that you should put on the end of the arm, the best tool, does not resemble how a person would do the task. It will do it in a totally different way and be mechanically simple. And then the programmers have to program that arm. And my kind of mind has to fix that arm and maybe come up with ways to make it more waterproof because that's a big problem in the meat industry. It's a very hostile environment for the robot. You know, so what I think a better, yes, I can do some things to learn some math stuff, but I was looking at that Strategio game in my science this morning. I'm going, uh, no, I, I'd never be able to, I can't remember all the sequence, uh, pattern planning in the future. I can't do that. But the thing that the AI program did is it learned how to play that game at the expert level with no training. All it got was uh, it, it has to be told the rules and and then it would get feedback of whether you know winning and losing. And there was no real no that's like really it's all pure pattern thinking. Not my kind of thinking. But somebody has to say you got to put watertight doors on that nuclear reactor. And that wasn't done. It's super simple. 
And I'm going, how could you not see you needed waterproof doors? Ancient old technology, low tech technology. They've got them now. I've gone on the Japanese websites. They have real big fancy ones and they brag about them. The, build, the ability to see something in a certain category that can set a person Well, you apart. see, the best thing is teams of people recognizing how they can work in a complementary manner. That is the key. You need both when you're dealing like with factory automation, for example. Now, one thing that came to mind is as far as people who, when you think of visual thinkers, who are some of the first notable individuals that come to mind or one and how they exemplify that? Well, let's look at Michelangelo. He was probably autistic, dropped out of school at age 12, grubby little kid. He said his hygiene was terrible, but he was exposed to great art. Every church was commissioning great art. He also grew up with stone cutting tools. So the, the, now there's a place to express the, the talent. He was exposed. Then he started making things. And then another artist uh, uh, took him into his shop and mentored him. So first of all, his exposure and then mentoring. I had a very good science teacher mentor. I also had a contractor that seeked me out um, and for me to design jobs for him. And he was an important mentor. He showed me how to get my business started. I had no idea how to do that. I mean, just, you know, basic stuff like that. Hmm. Right. Michelangelo is a key one. Well, Either Michelangelo or... would be a good example. And so what would happen to him today, he'd probably see that if the kids that were playing the video games, they're not becoming masters in that industry. If those kids were getting top programming jobs, the problem today, computers don't show their guts anymore. Back in the old days when the thing would crash, you'd get the blue screen of death. But the blue screen of death was covered with code. That's something for the kid to get interested. Now when they crash, it just freezes and then it takes my router out. Which I do know how to fix that. That takes 30 minutes. And But I don't see anything. All I know is if it starts to buffer roll bad, I better punch the red red box fast so I don't lose the router. But I don't, you don't, I call it computers don't show their guts anymore. Because on the early video games, kids got into computing playing them because they broke constantly and they get the blue screen of knowledge is what it should have been called, the blue screen of knowledge. Because then they'd be wondering about what all this weird code is. You don't see it much anymore. But every once in a while, I'll be walking around in the airport. One of the monitors will be messed up. And you'll see some code. And it's something I notice. I don't understand the code, but usually they're just off. And it just has a single error message or something on it. It'll say system error or something like that. And that's all it says. Where before, the computer would show off its, I call it showing its guts. And these, like kids are, these kids are just, you know, playing video games on disability check when they ought to be fixing things like water infrastructure. Also, the autistic kid, if he's in charge of the water system in a city. It will be the single most important thing in the world to him. You want somebody that loves the waterworks to take care of it. That's where there a little bit of fixation can be good. When you're hyper focused on one thing and it matters to you, you take care of it like an extension of yourself. Well, there's lots of back doors into jobs, and I tell parents you got to find back doors into jobs, like. Um, just the other day, I talked to a guy that's um, doing purchasing for a major university. He started out working for an extermination company, you know, and then he started going into the office and ordering materials. So now you're learning like purchasing agent. And then somebody saw he was good at that. Some co housing contractor hired him to be in charge of ordering materials. You see, he just worked his way up back door. 
that he is now purchasing construction stuff for a major university now. See, that's an example of a back door uh, uh, going in the back door and just working your way up. In, in through the system. Now, one thing that comes to mind is what is a early on, were there any key people that guided you in the direction of what you have done? Are there yes. any individuals? Um, that I, was very, I, didn't, I didn't speak until age four. I was very lucky to get into a very good early intervention program run by two teachers that worked out of their home. Um, so by the time I was two and a half, I looked severely autistic. Uh, I was in a very good program. My mother always encouraged my ability in art. And one of the problems you have with autistic kids is they get fixated on just one thing. And I would draw the same horse head over and over again. And she said, well, let's draw the whole horse. Let's draw the saddle. Let's draw the stable. Broaden it. She broadened my art ability. Let's use other media like watercolors. Let's maybe paint a picture of a beach. She took my art skill and she broadened it. You see, the mistake that parents make is stomp out a fixation. Of, of, Transportation is a very, very common fixation. Cars, trains, airplanes. Well, that can be broadened. You can read about aviation. You could do on, uh, learn how an airplane works, you know, starting out with the Wright brothers. So that's the history of aviation. You see how, that, see how I'm broadening that interest in things like airplanes. Um, and so I want to broaden the fixation rather than just trying to stomp it out. I had a great elementary school teachers. High school was a mess. I got kicked out of a re regular ninth grade for throwing a book at a girl. They called me a retard. Um, and then when I went to boarding school, they put me to work uh, cleaning nine stalls every day, running a horse barn. I had no interest in studying. See, this is where my science teacher came in. My science teacher gave me interesting projects with optical illusions. And now I had a reason to study, become a scientist. Overnight, my motivation changed. Still couldn't do algebra. And um, I had to drop a physics class. I had to drop the computer programming class. And I went into psychology. Had to have a major with less math. But the point I want to get across right now, yeah, we need the math heads, but we also need the people like me to say, Put the watertight doors on it. You need both types. What would, what would you say is a a message for, let's say someone thinks in uh, pictures, what would you tell basically your 10-year-old self to do better in life or get, get a head start at that point? Well, my 10 years old, I was out uh, playing with all kinds of kites. I was building all kinds of little things. That's why I got this children's book, Calling All Minds. It's all my little kids' projects that I did. I'd spent hours tinkering with little parachutes and little kites to perfect them so they'd fly better. So the parachute would open up more easily. I made like a cross thing out of coat hangers. I was maybe in second grade. I can remember my little kids' hands could barely, barely work the pliers, so I'd dent the wire and then I'd bend it the, the, like that to, to cut it. And kids aren't you doing those kind of things anymore. Oh, and yes, tools, that definitely was into that. Second grade, hammer, plier, and pliers and screwdriver. Saws at fifth grade, a little tiny hand saw. Uh, you know, kids aren't doing those, those kind of things. Um, and then the bullying and teasing was horrible. And the only places I was not bullied and teased was friends who shared interests. I can't emphasize that enough. Oh, well, I'd be in the robotics club today. But I want to work on the mechanics of the robot. And somebody else is going to do the programming. You see, that's where you need to have both. Friends with shared interests. Friends who shared interests. And back then it was model rocket club, building circuit boards, and riding horses. Friends through shared interests. Those are the That's only cool. places where I was not bullied. People can find that more easily sometimes today through internet. Groups. Yeah, and then and, you know I want to also want to promote 
kids get interested in what they're exposed to. I mean, there's a lot of garbage on the internet. I like to look at it sort of like a big green lawn full of dog droppings. Lots of good stuff out there, but don't step in the dog droppings. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> My last question to you is on books, because you have written many books, including this one. How do you have the ability to come up with so many, uh, so, so much prolific nature in this category, whereas some individuals may not write a book their whole life? What is the quality of yours that has allowed you to produce a coherent package? Well, of many well quite a few of my them? books have had co-writers, but I wrote lots of articles, like in Beef Magazine, in Cattle Magazines, where you know, there's no co-writer. But they're relative to short articles, and I'd use a strict outline so I wouldn't ramble. And each book kind of has a niche. I have Thinking in Pictures as my autobiography. I've got my two kids' books, which are childhood projects. Uh, Betsy helped me with those. Um, I've got Animals in Translation, Animals Make Us Human. I had a co-writer for that. See, long stuff, I need the organization. You know, then I have a book called The Way I See It, which is actually a collection of uh, magazine articles. There's little short chapters. I mean, I wrote lots and lots of stuff, uh, magazine articles. Okay, scientific journal articles, I've written those all by myself. Um, but it, see, that has a very strict format. Like, let's say, writing up an experiment. Introduction, the reason why you did the study, uh, methods, statistics, results, and then discussion. And, and that having that outline really helps. I've written a lot of that stuff, you know, as a sole author. But one of the things that motivated me was get information out there. Get information out there that people can use. That that's something that that really interested. And I have my cattle handling books and um you know a lot of you know the drawings I already had them. Then we had to have a whole bunch of it redrawn for the book. But it it's uh, I don't know. Work is something that motivates me. You know, I'm 75 now, and people say, well, why, why haven't you retired? Well, I get bored if I retired. I'm doing a lot of speaking engagements. I, of course, with COVID, I got grounded for an entire year. But um, we had a great time uh, writing a book during that time. But one of the places where I do need help is on real long things is with organizations. I can write short things just fine, as long as I make a real strict outline. And I recommend that to people that ramble. Bring in people that can help with the longer. Well, the longer things. And then, but something like I'd write a magazine article for a cattle magazine, that was maybe seven or eight double spaced pages, sometimes six double spaced pages and pictures. And what I used to do, I used to get to pick, pick out the pictures first. And then write the article. I like that strategy. I've done so much that you you can put some of the pieces in place. And well, then... and you know they, and then the pictures illustrated things I wanted to get across, and then I would make then I would make an outline. The other thing that helped me with writing, and when I got thrown out of school in ninth grade, I had good writing skills. I uh, teachers marked up my work, they red marked that work up, and I. Uh, and then I'd have to rewrite it. And I'm seeing today a lot of students, just regular students, their writing skills are horrible. Run on sentences. They can't explain how they do things. I've had a lot of um, graduate students even today, awful writing skills. I find out they got through school without writing a book report. You see, by the time I, you know, I was a so-so student in elementary school, but I did book reports in sixth grade. That teaches you how to summarize. I think it's a very, very important skill. And the teachers red marked my work up, and then I had to correct it. I thank them for doing that. And I'm finding out that some of these students are awful writing. And that's now. Um, they never had a teacher mark up their work. They didn't have to do term papers or book reports. And I'm not the only professor right now complaining about dreadful writing skills. Okay, you got to write up your experiment. Tell me how you did it in clear language, in your method section. This is another place we need people like me methods reviewing of scientific articles. That's what I concentrate on. Tell me how you housed your animals. What did you feed them? It matters and it affects results. And that's often left out. 
They have all this fancy statistics, all this fancy math. I get in there, rip apart the method section because I got to visualize how they did their experiment. And they'll leave out, I remember one paper, uh, they talked about a concentrate feed. And I go, what is it? What did you feed these animals? That had been left out. Well, I don't think it got left out of the final paper. But I said, all this stuff matters how you housed your animals, especially when they're doing behavior research. And there was a big thing. There's another thing in my visual thinking book. There's um, an example of cancer research wrecked. Millions of dollars worth of cancer research wrecked. Because they didn't write down that at one lab they used a magnetic stirrer to stir the cancer cells. And the other lab used a little Ferris wheel contraption for test tubes. I've forgotten what it's called. But it's very gentle. And it changed the results. It matters. Little $300 devices. And they didn't specify which one they used. It wrecked a ton of research. It matters what mixing device you use for your cancer cells. And that example is in the visual thinking book. And that's the kind of stuff, yeah, you've got to tell me exactly what you used. The importance of editing, correction, details, feedback for application purposes. No, it, but the problem is you should explain your methods so that another research group could replicate your experiment. Because one of the big problems right now in a lot of research, biomedical, some of the worst on this, is you can't replicate it. Because they didn't describe their methods accurately enough. And that thing with the mixing devices is a prime example. One of the most important parts of a scientific paper is replicability. And well, if that's that right. It's not there. It's not useful. Yeah. Fair point there. Yeah, if it's not replicatable, that's not a good paper at all. Interesting. I would like to say, well, before I would mention that, where can people find your work and how would you direct them? Okay, your well, I have two websites. I have grandon.com, which is my livestock, and then I have templegrandon.com for autism. Visual thinking is available on Amazon, your local bookstore. There's a publisher's uh, website. It's you know available in all the different places. It's in um, hardback and um, ebook, both. Also, there's an audio book, which I read the first part of it, just the first part of it myself, and then a really good professional reader reads the rest of it. Um, and so um, go out and get the book is all I can say. Uh, the first step is you have to realize different minds exist. And then let's look at how they can work together in complementary ways. Because back when I worked in construction, we used to talk about stupid suits. Now, at that point that I did that, and the other people I worked with did it, we didn't even know that it was a different kind of thinking. But then the kind of, then you have a suit salesman who thinks he can uh, run a construction site. That was a mess. Too big an ego. Wouldn't listen to anybody. Oh, man. $20 million mistake there. Right. You better listen to the people in the shop when they tell them things. And he didn't. We have to listen to the no, people. No, it, that... it was a fiasco of a job. No, the first step is realizing that different kinds of thinking exist. And and let's figure out how they can work in complementary manner. Dr. Temple Grandin, I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode discussing visual thinking and bringing to us various examples of application and messages related to that. Well, thank you so much for having me. Glad to, and we are out.